Witanu. Located around 1,100 kilometres northeast of Perth, the small Australian town now lies all but empty, with only a handful of residents remaining. During the 1950s, Wittenham was known as the Pilbara region's largest town, a monument of prosperity. But today, it is a ghost town. The town was originally constructed to support the local mine. From 1950 until the early 1960s, Wittenham was Australia's only supplier of asbestos, with around 161,000 tonnes being mined. During that time, approximately 20,000 people lived and worked in the town. Asbestos mining at Wittenoom was the greatest occupational health and safety tragedy in Australia. Comparable to the Chernobyl and Bhopal catastrophes, Wittenoom was shut down in 1966 with a dreadful legacy of asbestosis and mesothelioma for the 20,000 men, women and children who lived and worked there. Sadly, a great many more people will continue to die or become disabled by asbestos-related diseases across Australia before the epidemic finally peaks. By 2020, the total deaths Australia-wide due to asbestosis is estimated to climb as high as 45,000, with several thousand of these being attributed to exposure in Wittenoom alone. The man most credited with exposing the health risks from asbestos mining at Wittenoom is Dr Jim McNulty. We visited Jim in his home in Perth to try to better understand the events of the Wittenoom tragedy. I was working in England and, and TB I was a chest physician in Stoke on Trent. And Stoke on Trent had a lot of uh, dust disease, both from the coal mining industry and from the pottery industry. So I had a fair bit of experience in now. Uh, in, minor, in people coming in with dust disease, silicosis or coal miner pneumoconiosis or whatever, as well as TB. And then uh, I had a ring from a doctor whom I'd worked for in South Wales. And he said that uh, he'd been asked to find somebody to go to Carl Gurley, who was experienced in dust diseases and TB. So in Carl Gurley, I, I became, I was a chest physician, and I became medical superintendent of the Carl Gurley Hospital. When I was there, uh, I, had a, I had a mobile unit, X-ray unit, that returned from a normal tour to Whitnam and brought back X-rays from the asbestos miners there, and that showed a, a very considerable degree of uh, lung disease due to asbestos. And it was so bad, in fact, that they uh, there were X-ray changes due to asbestos in lungs of miners who had only worked there for two years which would be quite incredible by any, any occupational health standard. Anyhow, uh, I went out with myself and uh, was horrified by the conditions that I found. The whole town was laid with asbestos tailings as road surfacing. When you stepped off the plane, there's a flurry of dust which contained asbestos fibres. They uh, drove up in a car to the, to the pub to stay the night and as the car stopped the dust was spread up, up and became airborne and you could, you could feel the dust in your teeth almost. So at every vehicle movement, as it was later in the time, uh, stirred up asbestos which contained asbestos fibres. In Whittenham, you didn't have to work in the mine to develop dust disease because of the extensive use of the tailings around the town site. So that uh, not to the, ma the mine managers and the managerial staff were often affected, as particularly sadly, some of their children. Entrance to the mine was halfway up a cliff hill face, and the dust was very bad all throughout the mine. And what was a very bad feature, a particularly bad feature, was the dust extraction scheme. The dust extraction system removed some of the dust and discharged it above roof level, but it flowed back to the mill and staff offices. The dust was also discharged at the same level as the main entrance to the underground mine, so the air entering the mine already contained dust. 
Even when the expensive extractor was working properly, it merely took the dust out of the mill and dumped it on the lawns, making it more dangerous outside than inside the mill. That actually is the old, what's called the old colonial mill. It was an old mill that they had, which was only used sometimes uh, when they got more pressure, and that was just horrendous dust everywhere. And the first crushings took place there, and the ore was gradually crushed more and more as it came down towards the bottom of the mine, where it came out as fibre, and there's a bagging plant down at the bottom uh, where the, it was put into bags, out of a chute, into bags. The bags were hessian bags, so if you can imagine lifting a hessian bag which is full of fine dust and put it over your shoulder, I mean, it's, the dust is outside the bags. It's there. And you can find the same thing going down to the wharf at Fremantle when they're loading up the ships, dropped from the top of the hold down to the, the level and you see the dust rising everywhere. The, the new, new mill was an improvement because of more water on it, but water was scarce. And also there was a tendency to not to wet the ore too much. Wet ore was unacceptable to the international people who wanted the ore. So therefore, it, it tended to be uh, just a sprinkle. So it was, still, it was still pretty dry when it came out of the mill. Only later I came to understand that there were hurdles in regard to prevention. Not all, first of all, was that the water supply was poor. So they couldn't sort of dredge it the way in which you might like, as one big meals. That uh, money was short that it wasn't uh, a very successful operation, that the mines inspector uh, who were willing and wanted to do something were largely ineffective, and that the dust sampling techniques they were using were ineffective. And as you would know yourself, that they, if you're going to resolve a problem, you've got to identify what the causes are and, uh, and why it's a problem, and then uh, tackle that and dust control is the primary thing. The mine consisted of a number of stopes and a milling operation. Working conditions inside the mine were poor. Dust particles were visible in the air and in some cases were so thick they reduced visibility. The underground was humid and poorly ventilated. The miners worked in a cramped, stooped position as the stopes were low, some as low as about a metre. And the miners' constant use of handheld tools in these conditions often caused Raynaud's syndrome, resulting in pain and numbness of the hands. Employees worked continuously amongst the asbestos dust in the poorly ventilated mine and mill, sometimes wearing respirators which were ineffective and believed by Jim and the other visitors to be largely for show. You couldn't sneak into Whitnam, uh, in the sense that, uh, or you could by road I suppose, but uh, Mickey Mouse Airlines, the airline of flew us up, they, they were largely sponsored by a colonial sugar refinery and they blew asbestos and they knew everybody who was coming to the mine and they knew when I was going to the mine. And I'm not, I'd like to say that they dressed the whole place up and cleaned it up when I was going there, but they certainly uh, uh, tried to make it not as bad as it was. Between 1957 and 1962, Jim repeatedly warned the company's manager of the dangers to the miners and the people living in the town. Mine management took no significant action. The top brass from Colonial Sugar Refinery, who ran the mine, uh, came to see me. And there you are. I can still remember, I'll use reply to her language, but they said, all oh, this fuss about dust is bull dust, isn't it? And uh, I tried to tell them that, uh, about the amount of disease that I'd already found in, in the miners after such relatively short exposures, which were a scandal by any standard. Attempts to get uh, changes made to dust measurement, and particularly, uh, were blocked by uh, people who had done this, the same thing for many years. They couldn't appreciate that uh, it was, you couldn't measure asbestos with a sampler uh, because the asbestos clogged up the orifice, the fibres clogged the orifice up, and therefore uh, you, you couldn't get a, get a proper sample. The actual one we used to use came in that did show the fibres properly. Uh, and we used that, and the first dust sampling that took place then at the mine by the mines inspector and by myself uh, were hideous. They had a crude level of 300 particles per cubic centimetre or something, and the dust levels just came back to a thousand plus. And that was uh, everything, you know, silica, fibre, whatever, with the additional trouble that the fibre tend to block the orifice and therefore you weren't getting a true sample anyway. So all you could really say about it is it's just too dusty. 
The 1959 annual report of the Public Health Department expressed particular concern about the numbers of Wittenoom men affected by asbestosis and their relatively young age and the extremely short dust exposures. Unfortunately, the Public Health Department did not have the power to order the company to close down the mine. That was the responsibility of the Mines Department. It's difficult to understand why the mine and mill were allowed to operate without adequate risk control measures and why nothing was done to force the company to clean them up, adopt safer work practices or close down their operations. It was a tragedy. It should not have been allowed to develop as it did. But I recognised the needs for development in Western Street at the time. I recognised too the, uh, the lack of... Uh, awareness of, of the scale of the problems which was partly due to uh, deliberate blindness closing a mind to it and partly due to the isolation and how far away it was I mean it might have well been in Timbuktu if you like as, as, as written in, as far as the people in Perth were concerned the lack of feedback from it because most of the workforce were uh, migrants off ships with very little English and who were sent up there and who uh, wept on scene, if you like, uh, unheard. And, and the whole climate in, in West Australia at the time was pro-development and against anything which inhibited that. Uh, so it was summed it up, really. Uh, the government didn't want to be aware of problems. So they were inclined to, to close their eyes and close their ears to problems. Nineteen eighty eight saw the first victories in court for Wittenum mesothelioma victims. The judge ruled that CSR acted with continuous, conscious, and contumelious disregard for its workers' safety. CSR acknowledged liability for asbestos related disease at Wittenum. On june thirtieth, two thousand and six, the government shut down the power grid to Wittenoom and the majority of the residents have relocated. The town now stands as a stark reminder of the dangers of choosing progress over safety and of the many unheeded warnings. If we have learnt anything from Wittenoom, only time will tell. <laughs>